Okay, good evening and welcome to chapter 35 of the Living Marriage. As we're nearing the end of this book, there's only chapter 35 today and 36 on Thursday. And then maybe next week I'll do an outro. He has an appendix over here where he discusses five topics in greater detail, you know, more from the sources. I'm not going to spend time on that. I'll maybe give a synopsis of what he says over there in the outro, which I'll probably do next Monday. And then hopefully next Thursday, we're going to start a new book about Shalom Bias. You know, the part of Shalom Bias that's not related to the bedroom. Everything else in Shalom Bias, even though, as I mentioned many times, it's definitely not as important. But it could play an important role um, if we think about it in one light. And we'll talk about it when we get there. The intro, hopefully, will next Thursday of that book. It's called The Ten Really Dumb Mistakes That Really Smart Couples Make by Rabbi Ben Sion Schaefer from Muncie um, of the Shmooz. <coughs> Pretty popular book nowadays. Hit the shelves, I don't know, a couple months ago. All right, <clears throat> so this title is chapter, The Sin of Adam Arishon. Uh, we touched on this earlier. Adam Arishon sins. Again, he understands that as literal. It's really, the story actually happened. I don't believe the story is actually literal. Um, but what was this, the, the state of Adam Arishon before he sinned? Right, so he brings the Svarno, one of the Perusha on Chomesh, who explains and Voracious, I'll read the translation. They were naked and they were not embarrassed, right, before they before they ate from the Arita Das. For at that time, all their actions and all their limbs were exclusively focused on doing the will of their creator and not to achieve transient pleasures at all. And in this way, their zivok, their intimate relations, were like eating and drinking, which was needed. So too the subject of these organs were to them, just like a mouth and a face and the hands are to us. From the, so that's what the Svarno says. So basically what the Svarno is saying, and he expands on this, is that before Adam Rishon sinned, before he was, you know, he was naked in, Adam, in Gan Eden, they obviously, they were together, him and his wife, they produced Cain and Hevel before they sinned, right? That's clear from Ghazal. So they just, like the Gemara said, there was no even, there was no even pregnancy, right? They went up to the bed as two, and the Gemara says, that the, the Medrash or the Gemara says, they came down as four, right? They had, she, they were together, and in the bed, after he impregnated her, they already had Cain and Hevel fully formed. So it was obviously a very different situation back then. Again, I don't believe this is literal. I believe man, when he was created originally, there's a concept of pregnancy. But, you know, it is a metaphor. But <clears throat> there has to be some explanation of what man is like. Because why is it relevant to know what man was like before the Adam or Eitz Even though that would say we're born in. According to me, we were born into a situation where you already ate from the Eitz Hadas, Right? You already have the evil inclination inside of us. The answer is, is that it's relevant to Olam Haba. And... Because we believe in Olam Haba, we believe that Gan Eden maybe is, you know, part of Olam Haba or uh, the entrance way into Olam Haba. But really, that's what it is. The ultimate reward, right? I believe, is Gan Eden. What was Gan Eden? Man and woman were naked, right? Men and women were naked. Imagine going in the streets, and all men and all women are naked, right? What would you think of a situation like that? Would you be disgusted by it? Would you be happy to see everybody naked? Would you care? So it seems from the Svarno was saying that you wouldn't care, right? Just like I look at someone's, you know, you can show me a hundred hands over here, you know, you know, unless, you know, Seinfeld talked about it. Some, some people have very nice hands. It could be a hand model. But um, in truth, you know, hands are not something that really gets, you know, someone's, um, you know, get someone excited. It doesn't get someone excited to see someone's hands or to see their face. I mean, some people's face are nice. If you see a nice woman's face, you might get you excited. But, um, you know, to see, you know, so to see a person naked wasn't a big deal, right? It's like, who cares? Like, you know, like, who cares? So what's important in life? If that's not what you're enjoying, before Adam Arishon, which I'm saying, I'm assuming is going to be what's going to be, you know, after you know, Mashiach comes, and after an Olam Haba, or even before Mashiach comes, a person who's able to overcome his Yetzir Hara, and to experience, I believe there's a constant Olam Haba presently, I believe there's certain people in the world that do live in a state of Olam Haba now, you know, uh, if you believe in, you know, reincarnation, and people being reborn again, which I do believe in, it's a big part of Judaism, Kabbalism, uh, I believe, Kabbalistic thought, that there is reincarnation, you know, most religions subscribe to some form of reincarnation. You know, Hinduism, Buddhism talk about it. I think even Muslim and Islam and Christianity also believe in it. 
Um, so you believe in reincarnation, people either were successful in their first lifetime or they were successful. If they're not successful in their first lifetime, they're reborn and they're living in Gehenna. If they were successful, at least to a certain extent, so they're living. And overall, they're living in Olam Haba, which to the person who's living their first time, they don't see the difference. They can't understand because, you know, we're composed of two parts. We're composed of the physical outside body. And we're composed of a metaphysical, you know, body, which is really a body. It's a goop. It's also just we can't be in touch with that in our first lifetime. And we're more in touch with that after we die and we're reincarnated. You don't have to reincarnate as a person. You can be reincarnated as a stone. You can be reincarnated as a body of water. I don't, I don't know. I, I, I'm living my first time. I have no idea. But I can tell you this is my, what, I, what I assume, the reason that it was introduced, to tell you that Ganeiden... And Olam Haba is basically that's what it is. It's people walking around naked and no one's embarrassed, right? No one's embarrassed. So I think this is the most enjoyable thing in the world, to be honest with you. Not like the Sparno says that people didn't care. No, it's like it's like people care right now. Imagine you tell people that all the women in the world walk around not wearing clothes, right? Some women are not attractive without clothes on. I'm saying, yeah, without clothes on, they're not attractive, very overweight. Some people, you know, were not attractive. But most women are attractive, more attractive without clothes on. You'd want to see, you know, you pay big money. People pay big money for something like OnlyFans, you know, or, you know, some porn people they pay money for. But, you know, it's a nice thing to always, you can't, to, to live in a world of porn. I mean, that that's pretty, <laughs> it's pretty high stake. That's pretty good, actually. Sounds like a pretty good Olam Haba, to be honest with you. So I think that's really what Olam Haba really is. So, you know, when you're reincarnated or you can reach a stage where you can see past the, the outer part, the clothes of the person, right? And you can see, you know, there's no clothes. People are wearing clothes, but they're not really wearing clothes. You can see underneath their clothes. So that's really what the world was before the Chet. And that's the reason that the Torah talks about it, I believe, is to tell you that that is what Olam Haba and Chiyas HaMesim is going to be like. People will be able to walk around without clothes, literally. After Mashiach comes and introduces whatever he has to introduce to the world, and it's accepted what Mashiach has introduced in the world, people will go back to their states of pre Das, where people walk around, un not embarrassed, walking around naked, both men and women. The women will enjoy the men, the men will enjoy the women. You know, people will just be together randomly. <laughs> Sounds like a nightclub, but, but um, you know, obviously, you know, people wouldn't, do it in a way they would do it in a healthy way unhealthy not an unhealthy way a lot of people you know that watch pornography and um you know swing with different girls every night you know but it's not enjoyable to them because the main reason it's not enjoyable to them is because when you shut off that computer screen or you know after it's over with the girl you have to go through another day before you get to the, to the next girl or before you know you wake up and turn on turn on the video screen it's not enjoyable to watch a video screen for so long so Life is enjoyable itself, but to live life where everything is readily accessible, everyone's naked, and everything is readily accessible, that, that's really what Olam Haba really is. That's why the Torah talked about it, I believe. The Sforno says, no, right? It's, he says, it's transient pleasures, right? It's just like eating and drinking. Eating and drinking you shouldn't even enjoy, and this you shouldn't enjoy also, right? Being together with a woman or seeing a woman naked, you shouldn't enjoy these things. No, it'd be like seeing the people with those hands, their mouth, you know? The real thing is to learn Torah. You know that's that's really what he's saying over here, right? What the real the real what's real what's really good? If that's not really good, what's really good, right? That's the best the physical world has to offer. So, what's the best the spiritual world has to offer? I don't know. Like like uh, like Victor Miller said, or I've heard many people say, the Olam Haba, you know, in the next world, if you merited Olam Haba, they're gonna give you a candle and a shtender and a sefer, and you learn. The people that like learning, so that would be their Olam Haba. The people that don't like learning, that don't learn in this world, they don't learn Dafyomi, they don't learn anything in this world. So it's going to be torturous for them. The people that are tzaddikim, that like learning, it's going to be amazing for them. For some reason, I don't think that's true. And I believe all the Rishonim and the Achronim, with the exception of the Rambam, believe <clears throat> that it's supposed to be a physical type of enjoyment, Olam Haba. So he talks about other Rishon's Chet over here. Um, he continues talking about the Nachash over here, the Nachash is a snake. He talks about the dangerous um, nature of the snake. Is. You know, he compares the Ezer Hara to the Nachash. You know, before the Nachash, before Adam Arisha, the Nachash 
was outside of man. It didn't look so dangerous, but if it bit him, it could be very dangerous. Now it's inside of us. We don't even know where it is, what's biting. He compares it, and he talks about a power, a person's imagination. He quotes from, who is it? The Svarno. The Svarno again. He says, <clears throat> the Chazal already explained Samuel, another name for the Satan, the Himalayan was riding on the snake. Their intention is to explain that the power of desire that seduces man achieved through the power of imagination, which sends him, sends to man, imaginary physical pleasures, draws him from the path of completion of the blessed one intended. Truly, the power of physical desire with imaginary pleasures that drive him are easily associated with physical actions and distort the intention of the Creator. This is when the power of the intellect does not stand against them, the power of the imagination and protests against them. So, basically, the snake tr tricks you. That's what, what the, the Yetzir Hara does, the evil inclination does. It tricks you. He gives an example. Imagine someone offered you $10 million to give them all the information about your private bank account. If you know that in any case you don't have so much money in your account, you'd feel like a fool if you didn't jump on the opportunity, right? Sounds pretty good. You only got, you know, I don't know, $10,000 in your bank account. The snake tells you, I'll give you $10 million or tell me the, the code to your, to your bank account. Of course, why not? Yeah, what if you discover the offer was for $10 million of monopoly money? Not only will the test appear, there wouldn't even be a test. This is the art of the evil inclination. He convinces a person, and in, in any case, his account isn't so big. Then he promises to give him a new, much more rewarding account, which turns out to be counterfeit, maybe... Instead of monopoly money, we can use counterfeit money. The counterfeit money, you know, is a lot more luring than monopoly money because presumably you'd be shown what money you'd be getting. But the point is the same, that he tricked you. But even he agrees. There is one essential fault in this metaphor. If the person in the story makes a bad deal, he simply ends up with an empty bank account. However, the evil inclination takes the very life of the one who follows it. If a person offered you a cup of very sweet-tasting poison in exchange for the information in your bank account, you'd think he was insane. You know, when it comes to spiritual matters, Often when a person is faced with a decision between life and death, evil inclination can incite one to choose death. The Svarna explains the primary factor which allows man to protect himself from illusions of the evil inclination is his free will to use his seichel, his intellect, to reject the falsehood and embrace the truth. So, that's what the Yitzhahara is. You have to use your seichel, your intellect. I agree with him on this. You have to use your free will in life. Free will is making decisions, doing the right thing. Doing the right thing doesn't mean, you know, abstaining from the physical world. We live in a physical world. Decisions are how to use the physical, what in what ways to do, what choices to make in the physical world. Um, and he brings at the end of the chapter that it's a well-known Chazal that Amar of Yitzchak, Martin Kedushin says, Yitzchak shal adam mischadish lebe chal yom, shema rak rak chal yom. His Yitzchak gets stronger, right? Amar of Yitzchak shal adam mischadish lebe chal yom, it gets stronger every day. Mavakish lamita, it gets stronger every day. Mavakish lamita, I want to kill him. You have to try your best. At the end of the day, the Yitzhar is so strong. It's deeply embedded in you. It causes you to think good is bad, bad is good. If you try your utmost, then Hashem will help you. If you, just, if you don't try, then you're dead. The snake has killed you. And it's really true. This I agree with them on. That free will, it's hard to choose the right thing, right? I remember for many years, I struggled with the gates are horror. Everyone struggles with the gates are horror. You know, you don't realize it until you're the age of, let's say, I don't know, everyone, I think 16 and 18, 14 to 16 to 18, you get to a certain point in life where all of a sudden, you know, I don't remember the first like 15, like 17 years of my life. I remember when I woke up one day, I was 18 years old, and I'm like, like, and I'm like, wait, what, what should I be doing with my life, you know? And I started opening a kitchen with an arach, and you know, trying to figure out the right thing to do. I don't remember what I did the first 18 years of my life. I remember the high points, maybe the highlights and the low lights. But besides, I don't remember too much. But I remember there was this point, I don't remember exactly what day it was, when I got the Chira Chavshis was handed in my hand and, you know, at free will, I had to make choices. And it's really hard. You have to make, people say you make 20,000 choices a day. I don't know exactly if that amount, you know, it depends on the day, but you have to make a lot of choices. That's what free will is to make decisions. It's hard not to do it's hard to do that to make the right decisions, right? To choose the right thing. What is the right thing? Is Judaism the right thing? You know? Some people are, are born not Jewish. What are they supposed to do? Is, they're born Christian. Is Christianity the right thing? They're born in, you know, in, in East Asia, you know. Is, is atheism the right thing? Is you know, everyone and I believe there are people that are born all over the world, all, all the religions. It doesn't make a difference. The answer is do the right thing, right? We all know deep down inside, what the right thing, what the wrong thing. And if you do the wrong thing, you could fix that by doing chuba and regretting it immediately. 
and resolving to, to make the right next decision, the right decision. So I will tell you, in my life, there was a point, you know, where I exercised the free will as much as I could. And I wasn't sure, you know, as growing up as a from Jew, and when I became more from, I became more Haredi, more attached to the Torah, you know, literal interpretation of the Torah, which makes sense to me. You know, the Torah, I would, I would have said, you know, for many years, that literalism of the Torah is the truth. Uh, now I don't believe that 100%, but not that I'm not a religious Jew, I do keep the halachas, but, um, you know, not with, with a grain of salt. Um, but there was a point in my life, um, was it about, I don't know, four or five years ago, where, you know, the framework of my choice making changed. Instead of, you know, choosing, you know, when it came, you know, that's the hardest thing when we have to make when it comes to physical pleasures, because there's something, our subconscious tells us there's something evil about enjoying food, definitely enjoying a woman, you know, so enjoyment is looked at like negatively by, you know, and we think, of, and but you, it's necessary, right? It's necessary to eat. You're not going to not eat. You're going to die if you don't eat, right? If you starve yourself, you're going to be very gaunt. And it's going to be very hard for your life. So even, you know, you look at the, the, the Sfar Makadosh, and they all tell you to eat. But you eat for Avodah Hashem. You eat to serve God and that have the right kavanas. But what do you eat? What types of food? You eat foods that taste very bland. You eat foods that taste good. So I try to, like, manage this, you know. I want to, like, balance it. Because you don't want to appear strange or weird. You know, you're sitting down to uh, a dinner. Or you go out to a restaurant or something like that. What are you going to order? You can order water and a piece of bread, and that's it. Everybody else is eating steaks. What are you going to do? You're going to look strange. So you try to balance. You don't want to look strange, but you don't want to get too much enjoyment from this world. So you try to sort of, that's what I was trying to do for many years, trying to balance it, you know, to look like everybody else. At the same time, I really thought the right way in life was to try to, to not indulge in pleasures of this world as much as possible. They're transient. This is not what the world is about. Until one, until about four years ago, it was my prop to my wife. My wife asked me a question. I was married then. We're in America, you know, and I just, she's like, what do you want for breakfast? We're eating breakfast at my parents' house in Long Island. And I'm like, I don't know. It's hard for me to make decisions while she eat for breakfast. I don't know, you know. Like you're on vacation. You want to, you know, people enjoy themselves more on vacation. They have fancy of breakfast on vacation. So what I do, you know, I try to figure out, should I have, you know, cream cheese, should I have cereal, you know. And then my wife's like, she says to me, I'm like, I'm trying to think about it. She's like, what do you like to eat? I'm like, whoa, what do you like to eat? That's the answer to the decision. <laughs> the answer to the question of how I should approach eating and really how I should approach enjoyment in this world is is not to avoid it as much as possible, but just to balance it to remain normal. That I should look like someone else, like everybody else who's trying to enjoy the world, all the regular small people in the world that are just running after their physical pleasures. They're eating their sushi, they're having their steaks. No. She told me, find out what you like. And you know what? Well, that's a challenge also. For the next four or five years, I've undergone this challenge, taken a new perspective when it comes. It's not what I like the least, but try to balance it so I don't look abnormal, so I fit into society. It's what do I like the most, but what I really like, because there's a lot of foods out there. A lot of, you go to the, the store, the supermarket, even here in Israel, they have a lot of cereals they sell on the shelf. There's like 30 cereals out there. How are you going to pick one? Not everyone knows they have their favorites, you know, but to find out really which one is your favorite, it's not so easy. It's not so easy. You have to work on that and make those choices. But that's the right choice to make. But that's, I believe, where Hashem helped me. Hashem gave me, where the Gemara talks about, that Hashem gave you, gave me the ability to make the right decision, to come, no, physical pleasures are not a bad thing. Eating the foods that you don't enjoy are the bad thing. It's kind of the opposite, right? And that's really what, what it is. It's kind of the opposite that... <clears throat> To eat things that you don't like is really to fast and to eat bland food is considered, you know, kfira. That's considered heresy. Because really what the Torah wants you is to enjoy the world. It makes sense. Now, everything makes sense now. Because Olam Haba, right, is going to be physical enjoyment. Eating and being together with women and seeing women naked. So this is what Olam Haba is. But you have to find out what you like. And, you know, just like this, because this book is a book about intimacy. And I've talked about all you have to find out what you like in the bedroom. Not everything every man likes in the bedroom, you know? And also it depends. There's certain women men prefer, certain men prefer certain women. You know, there are women that people would say objectively are good looking, but you know, there's different features uh, on women that men like, you know? Different, you know, some people like the face of the woman and I smile, some people like the breast, some people like the hips, some people like 
you know, the private area, not to talk about Volvo, whatever. But, you know, you have to find out what you like, and really like all of them, and like all of them. The question is, how do you enjoy them when you're with a woman in the bedroom? You know, and that, you have to be, you have to be married, or at least, if you're not from, at least be together with a woman in the bedroom, have experience. And just like eating, you need experience with that also. But it's about learning, and that's the right decision. That's when Hashem helps you. Hashem helps you. He changes the perspective. It's that, you know, how do I enjoy the, the world the most? And to the degree that we reach that level in our attempts, our ishtadlis, our attempts to enjoy, to figure out what we like in this world the best, right? And that's the focal point. The focal point is the pleasure of this world, but not to avoid them, to <clears throat> enlarge them, to uh, expand uh, and, and focus on exactly what we like and do always what we like. To that extent, we will earn Olam Haba and we will be transported into a world where you know, he talks about imagination in this world, and imagination, he says, it's a good thing. Why is it a good thing? Everything is a good thing and a bad thing. He says imagination is a good thing. Where does he say this? He says, although there are many positive uses of imagination, one of them is the power to produce positive inspiration and dreams of greatness. Every person that sees of greatness is yearning to reach a potential, and imagination allows the hidden potential to find expression through positive feelings of excitement. So he says that the positive act of having an imagination everyone, imagination, everyone knows what an imagination is, right? To believe you can reach a higher level. Now, he doesn't say what he's talking about. He probably means talking about becoming a bear with Tamil Kakam, becoming a bigger rabbi, a bigger tzaddik, but, you know, to become an Adam Gadol, a great person. You know, some people would see it as success in business. You want to earn a lot of money. But in my opinion, the imagination is used, not that you can think of what a great thing is, but that one day your imagination will be able, you know, imagination is really a true thing. Imagination is not, um, I don't think it's a false thing. Imagination is a product of your inner self, your metaphysical self. Everyone has an outer body, and the metaphysical body, which is largely covered and masked. Sometimes we realize that there is something else there. Most of the time we don't realize it. You know, when you dream, you realize there's something else there when, you, when you're sleeping. You know, a lot of times deja vu and things like that, you realize there's another part to yourself it's mask in this world. It's very hard to access it. But imagination is a product of that thing. And if we're successful enough, we can create our metaphysical body and let it overpower that physical body if it's possible. And that's really entering Olam Haba is where your imagination could actually see, you know, it's called x-ray vision, but you could actually see past people's clothes. You could wake up one day and everyone's naked. That's Olam Haba. That's really, you know, the truth. And that's, you know, and... And that's really the greatest thing there is because life is a great thing. The reason life is so difficult is because there's so it's so hard. We know there's things we like in life. We know certain good foods we like, good music you like. You know, women obviously is the biggest thing people like. Um, so the problem with it is it's so hard to get there. So much work, right? In order to experience the greatest pleasure, which is to be together with a woman, right? You have to, right, first date. Get married to a woman, at least in the from circles. And even if you're not in the from circles, you gotta go to bars. You gotta learn to pick up girls. Some people are incels; they can't do it. Most people are, are awkward socially. They're not able to do it. Not able to get in bed with a woman. So if you're not married to the woman, so then you gotta you gotta keep up the relationship as boyfriend girlfriend, which takes a lot of work. And she could dump you at any point, you know. And it's hard. And you gotta pay for it. And you gotta drive her places. And you gotta buy her gifts. How much of that time are you actually together in the bedroom? Most people end it after five minutes. So basically, three three times you were to slept with her for five minutes or fifteen minutes each. You know how much money and effort and time you spent on this woman, and what did you get? Life is depressing like that. It's terrible like that. You know, life is really depressing. Um, and in the from roots, you want to you want to get married. So you have stability. She's always going to be with you. Usually, she'll say yes if you want to be together with her. But you get bored of her after a while, and you have to you have children now. Children enter the picture. Children. Are a lot of work, not only a lot of work and money, but they also disturb the relationship between you and your wife. When you try to be together, the kids are always waking up. The kids are always annoying you, right? They're always running into your bedroom. You have to be afraid that the kids are always going to run. You have to have a peace of mind. You can go on vacation because who's going to watch the kids for such a long period of time? It costs a lot of money to raise the kids. And also, a man, he's only monogamy is only allowed now. So maybe for the woman, it's good. She likes the husband. Usually, she's not getting a great husband, so she's not going to like the husband. But for the man, you know, He's stuck in Manak. Even he has a great wife. He's going to want other women also. So he's stuck. So in this world, you're stuck. Even we we have access to those greatest things. And even when you're together, right? 
there's so many things that can throw you off, right? Your focus could be on the negative aspect, the thing that's bothering you, a noise, you know, a smell, um, a fly in the room. They could they could annoy you even when you're at the greatest, where you're at the point of, you know, the gmar bia, the ejaculation. You're enjoying it the most, but there's something that throws you off. All these things we have to contend with, that's why Olam Haba is really this world, is living in this world, except for the fact that instead of focusing on the negative, you're focusing on the positive. You, every second, you're seeing women in the street that are naked. <laughs> That's what I believe. I hope it's true. And, you know, you even have ability to sit at a, at a table with someone, a Shabbos table, and you could, you know, leave your body. You know, you could leave your body. You know, your physical body is here, but I can, my metaphysical body is complete now. I can go and walk over to someone, another woman at the table or somewhere else <laughs> and have relations with them or, you know, start kissing and hugging and having a good time with them. You think this is crazy, but I believe this is true about Olam Haba. And, you know, and, and no matter how boring the situation is, there's always women around. There's always women around, you know, and if there's no women around, you, you, you just saw women in the street and you can have you know, a meeting with them just because based on your recollection. That's what imagination does. The power of imagination is that metaphysical power which allows you to transcend to a new stratosphere. You're, you're living in this world, but you're also in another dimension also. I know it sounds kind of crazy and futuristic, but I believe this is really what Alam Haba is. I really believe it's true, and I hope it's true. And, and then life becomes great because you don't have to work so much. You could be in a monogamous relationship with your, with your wife, but you can be together with different women every day, you know. Maybe you can even experience it. You know, we don't know how strong the metaphysical body is. It can experience things just like um, a physical body. You're focusing on the positive. You see a great, you know, woman naked all around you. And you're able to engage in relations with women just based on recollection, imagination. You know, even if they're at the present, you could actually engage in, you know, at the table or somewhere in the room. You could do it in a physical perspective. That's the, the, the real power of imagination coming from a metaphysical body. I know I sound crazy and, you know, ridiculous over here, but let's see. Let's see if I'm right about this guy. I think I'm right. <laughs> anyway, I hope you enjoyed today. We'll see you next week. Uh, not next week. On Thursday for the last chapter, chapter 36 in this book. Hope you enjoyed. See you in the next one.